DeFi is a term used to describe the part of the crypto universe that aims to build a new financial system that's internet native and uses blockchains and smart contracts to replace the traditional intermediaries and trust mechanisms that are used in traditional finance. The term DeFi is short for decentralized finance. In today's financial system, if you want to move money, borrow or lend, buy or sell securities or insurance-like products, you need to use an intermediary like a bank, a broker, an insurance company or an exchange. And that whole system relies on all parties trusting that the intermediaries will act with fairness, honesty and within the law. In DeFi, the idea is to do all of the same things, but in a peer-to-peer -peer manner where blockchain-based smart contracts replace the middlemen, but still ensure that the entire process is fair and trustworthy. DeFi can be thought of as a blanket term for how crypto people are trying to build a new version of Wall Street, where central counterparties are replaced with decentralized software that deals exclusively in crypto assets with crypto versions of many of the products offered by traditional financial firms. They aim to do this without a lot of the red tape and regulations that govern the existing financial system. Decentralizing finance, they argue, might fix the problems in our current financial system, in part by erasing the power that big Wall Street banks have over our economy, markets and the general financial system. While DeFi has been generating a lot of press, it's not necessarily that big. Its total value locked is around $40 billion or so, which would make the entire DeFi industry combined the 52nd largest bank in the United States by deposits if it was a bank. Now, I should note that the size of the DeFi industry is quite volatile, and its total value lock six months ago was over $100 billion. DeFi optimists argue that their approach will eventually be cheaper, more efficient and more transparent than the traditional financial system is. And obviously, that's a very attractive proposition for most of us. They pitch the idea of a utopian financial future with no centralized intermediaries because those layers just add costs and inefficiency. On the other hand, a lot of people argue that this lack of regulation, consumer protections and other safeguards make DeFi unworkable. If you make a mistake and transfer the wrong amount of money in DeFi, there's no help desk to call to undo the transaction. You're simply out of luck. It was your mistake and you should have been more careful. Additionally, they argued that there are lots of costs associated with using DeFi protocols and that these systems are by no means as cheap and efficient as they claim to be. For these reasons and a few more that we'll look into shortly, DeFi has gained a reputation for being the wildest part of crypto's wild west, with regular thefts of tokens worth hundreds of millions of dollars as people exploit these poorly designed systems. In today's video, we'll look at a few examples from last week where the teams running various DeFi protocols had to step in and take control, showing that at least right now, DeFi and crypto in general is much more centralized than you might expect. We'll also discuss whether these new financial systems are likely to ever become truly decentralized and mainstream. But before I get to all of that, let me quickly tell you about today's video sponsor, Private Internet Access. I've been using VPN software for quite a while as I travel a lot and data security is very important to me. Private Internet Access is an easy to use and affordable VPN app for Windows, Mac, Android, iOS and more. VPN stands for Virtual Private Network and what it means is that all of your internet traffic goes through a secure tunnel and your data is encrypted making it much safer if you want to log on to your brokerage account from a coffee shop or an airport lounge. Private internet access is not just a great way to protect your data, but you'll also find that if you log into services like Netflix and Amazon Prime from different countries, different films are available. Private internet access is fast and reliable. They don't collect or track your data. You can use one subscription for up to 10 devices at the same time. 
There's a 30 day money back guarantee. So click the link in the description below to try it out risk free for less than $3 a month. And you'll also get three extra months for free. Okay, so last weekend, users of Solend, a lending platform on the Solana blockchain, proposed taking control of the wallet of its largest user. This was an unprecedented move in the DeFi world. The reason given was that the protocol operators worried that this whale account had a large margin position that was putting Solana, the blockchain protocol, and its other users at risk. The big user, or whale, had borrowed a huge amount of stable coins from Solend to fund a position in Solana's native Sol token. If the price of that token fell much more in the Brado crypto sell-off, the smart contract would automatically start liquidating this huge position in a way that could overwhelm market liquidity and cause huge losses for the other market participants who had lent to the whale. According to the operators, the ripples through the market meant that Solend could end up with bad debt. To avoid this, they decided to amend the smart contract to let Solend's team take over the whale's position and start liquidating it in over-the-counter transactions before the market hit the margin trigger and the automated selling began. In order to be allowed to do this, the team put the proposal to a hastily organized vote of its decentralized autonomous organization, requesting emergency powers. The proposal passed, but it looked like it had been forced through, which led to a backlash on Twitter, the worst kind of backlash. The team then withdrew the plan following this criticism, but said that they were committed to protecting user funds, transparency, and doing what's right. And then a third proposal to create new position limits to mitigate the risk in a more mechanical way was passed. I guess the takeaway from that situation is that most of the time code is law, except when you don't like the outcome and then you make something else up quickly, which is not as catchy a phrase at all. It might need some work. Okay, so next up, here's a great phrase for you. Due to hostile market conditions, Bancor's impermanent loss protection is temporarily paused. Okay, so that's confusing. What could it mean? Impermanent loss protection, temporarily paused. I guess something impermanent might be temporarily paused, and there are losses, but luckily they're impermanent. Okay, I worked it out. Bancor is a decentralized crypto exchange that allows users to trade cryptocurrency tokens. It basically works as an automated market making system where you can deposit your crypto, which will then be used to make markets. When things go well, you get a share of the profits, but when there are impermanent losses, which are just losses in the real world, Bancor then prints some of its own BNT tokens and gives them to you to make you whole. Thus, I guess the losses are impermanent because you get these loser tokens, which are valuable because crypto. I'm not sure that there's anywhere else where if you lose money, someone would offer you a piece of paper saying that you had lost money and that you and other people would gladly accept that piece of paper as being valuable. In fact, maybe even more valuable than the money you had lost. But anyhow, that's how things work in this day and age. This is kind of what happens when the participation medal generation gets to design financial systems. Anyhow, this turned out to be a great system when crypto in general was going up. Bancor could keep printing these tokens, which represent their core business operations losing money, and these would keep getting more valuable. Okay, it doesn't actually make much sense, but most importantly, this week we learned that when the loser token goes down, everything else falls apart, which is bad. The Bancor team explained it on their blog, but the takeaway is that if the price of BNT goes down, they could print more BNT to make holders whole for the loss, but doing this of course makes the price go down even more. This isn't precisely the same as the Terra Luna situation from a few weeks ago, but it's close enough that the differences barely matter.
Anyhow, last week, citing hostile market conditions, Bancor decided to temporarily pause the mechanism. I guess when losses are rare, these rare loser tokens possibly have a rarity value. But in hostile market conditions, loser tokens become plentiful. Anyhow, they said that they would ask those that hold the voting power to ratify the temporary pause. So that's that. I'll be nice and I won't call it a Ponzi scheme, as who knows, maybe these guys aren't actually Ponzi schemers. Maybe they're just not very smart. Do let me know your thoughts in the comments section below. And finally, MakerDAO, a collective that runs the DAI stablecoin, which is designed to be pegged to the dollar, voted to freeze a link to Aave, a lending platform, because of the latter's exposure to another struggling lending platform, Celsius. Now, some of the DeFi ideas like Bancor, for example, are a bit silly and they're easy to make fun of. And of course, that is my job here. But obviously not everything in the space is. There are many ways that over time something quite good could come from the DeFi space where there are fewer middlemen, greater inclusion and lower transaction costs for everyone. It can be argued that crypto in many ways has been speed running all of financial history and relearning all of the lessons of traditional finance. I used to hate history, didn't you? It's all just a load of stuff that's already happened. What are they doing over there? They're filming something. They're filming midgets. This isn't necessarily a bad thing, as speed running all of financial history from scratch means that you might make different, interesting and sometimes better choices about what to do about the lessons learned. But often this approach has just shown that there are good reasons for the ways things are done and that most people have simply forgotten what those reasons were. For example, sometimes the slower pace and high transaction costs that you see in markets are a function of government regulations. And on top of that, many market participants specifically accept higher costs in exchange for better service and more customer protections. Now, to a certain extent, the emergency plans that these DeFi protocols had to enact over the last few weeks were a vindication for global regulators who warned that some DeFi DeFi projects were much more centralized than their marketing indicated. The worry that users are left with is that governance in DeFi might be highly concentrated amongst a few big players that could possibly coordinate and change the rules when it suits them at the expense of other small users. A recent report from the Bank for International Settlements questioned whether DeFi projects could ever expand into an adequate monetary system because developers can't predict every potential market move. They argue that in the real world, it's impossible to write hard-coded contracts that spell out what actions should be taken in every contingency and that centralization allows firms to deal with this contract incompleteness. If you can't reasonably devise contracts that cover all possible eventualities, then central entities are just needed to resolve disputes. They additionally argue that more efficient methods to speed up and handle greater volumes of payments tend to lead to greater concentration of computing power. While regulators warn about the pitfalls of DeFi, the market is making its own judgments. For some DeFi believers, the unplanned moves by MakerDAO, Bancor and Solent this week are good as they just wash out the people who never fully committed to the DeFi ethos. But for others, this is simply reality reasserting itself in the marketplace. A new analysis from DARPA this week analyzed whether blockchain technology, which serves as the underlying transaction ledger for Bitcoin, DeFi and numerous other cryptocurrencies, is as decentralized as its biggest proponents suggest. 
they found that four mining pools make up 51% of the total Bitcoin mining activity, with two mining pools doing the same for Ethereum. They found that 60% of Bitcoin traffic is confined to just three internet service providers, and that around 4.5% of Bitcoin owners control 85% of the entire Bitcoin pool. So this decentralized industry is a lot more centralized than many people think. Is this a problem? Well, concentration can allow for a possible collusion and could limit blockchain viability. It raises the risk that a small number of large validators could gain enough power to alter the blockchain for financial gain. Additionally, large validators could deliberately congest the blockchain with artificial wash trades between their own wallets in order to push up the fees that other traders have to pay them to validate transactions. Another big issue highlighted is that validators are able to front-run big orders for higher trading profits. Now, front-running does also occur in traditional finance, but it is illegal and is punished by regulators who are on the lookout for it. Rent-seeking behaviors like this are just bad for market participants and could erode interest in DeFi going forward. The DeFi industry is of course aware of this, and discussions about changes to governance protocols, in particular to rein in collusion, have gained momentum. But adopting these changes would not alter the basic fact that some centralization appears to be unavoidable. History shows that new and innovative technologies often cause bubbles or come from bubbles. It's quite possible that new ideas that come from the crypto space will be of broader use in the future. DeFi might eventually play an important role in our mainstream financial system. On the topic of regulation, since the main products in DeFi and almost all of their challenges resemble those in traditional finance, a lot of the established regulatory principles could reasonably serve as a compass for future regulation. The basic tenet, same risks, same rules, should possibly apply if for no other reason to prevent regulatory arbitrage. Let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. If you enjoyed this video, you should watch my video on when pubs replaced banks during the banking strikes in Ireland in the 1970s. Don't forget to check out today's video sponsor, Private Internet Access, by clicking on the link in the video description. See you next week. Bye.